Uh, today we're going to talk about, say that, what, what is this? Thing? Will you read that for me? Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, that's what we're going to, we're going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about, uh, to declare the value of, that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to talk about today. And um, I really wanted to, to look at this from a broader perspective. Uh, you know, when you ask somebody what is worship, they gravitate immediately to praise and worship, right? It's, that's, that is the thing that we do when we worship. But worship is actually how we live our lives. We live lives of worship. It's a 24-7 kind of thing. So uh, wanted to kind of look at this a little bit perhaps differently. It was Brother, uh, was it Brother Lawrence who, who said, if I wash dishes as unto the Lord, you know. Everything that he did, he did it with a meditative and a, and a spiritual uh, focus. So the passage is one that y'all have heard from me many times. Uh, it's a great worship passage. Romans 12, 1 through 2, I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So what is your spiritual worship? To present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You know, music is a part of that, but it's not the whole of it, right? So we present our bodies, we present our lives, we present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And then it goes on to, to the part that is really critically important for us, especially in this day and age. Do not be conformed to, the, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the renewing of our mind is why we push so hard for small groups and for even if it's just you with another person, you by yourself study, you know, get into the Word of God, get into uh, the, the, the patriarchs and matriarchs of our faith. Now, anybody in here know about Chuck? Familiar with Chuck? He knows church. Chuck knows church? Well, he had a thing to do on worship, so here we go. Hey, what do you think is the most important thing we do as a Christian congregation? Sell tickets to Sunday's car wash? Plan services around the NFL schedule? Or serve up something better than tuna noodle casserole at the church potluck? Well, as important as that last one is, it is not the most important thing we do as a church. For those of you who said worship, ding, 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 winner, winner, chicken dinner, worship is the most important thing we do. The most important, oh, action we take as a Christian congregation because of what worship means. So what does worship mean? Sounds like that's what we're talking about, worship, on this episode of Chuck Knows Church. Oh no, that beats per minute is down. So, what is so important about worship, you say? This uh, all-important action that we take as a Christian congregation. Why all this stretching? Ooh, I can feel that in my glutes. Oh, all this stretching and, and uh, warm-up. And what does it have to do with worship? Follow me. Well, the word worship comes from the old Anglo-Saxon word, worthon. Worth on to declare how much something is worth. Worth on, pronounced worth on. <laughs> yeah, Chuck Norris has nothing on me. Worth on. Let's go. All right. Ooh, I think I pulled my rotator cuff. Ah, the actual old English spelling was written and pronounced worthship. Worthship. Try saying that five times real fast. Worthship, 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 worthship. That just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. It's too difficult, right? So I know. Hey, let's just clean up that funky spelling, make it easier on the old twisted tongue. So we did. And when I say we did, I mean they did long before I was born. Ah, so they cleaned it up and the word became worship. Worship. Also important to remember, worship 
is an action. <laughs> now you're getting it. A-C-T-I-O-N, action. That's what the early Christians thought anyway. <laughs> Just check out these three Greek words from the New Testament, uh, which all mean worship in English. They are sebomai, meaning to lift up high or to exalt. Proskuneo, meaning to bow down and Latrevo, meaning to serve. That's right. Verbs. Three virtually unpronounceable verbs. Yes, action words, meaning worship is not something we attend, but something we do. <clears throat> and these three Greek words, they all go together to lift up, to bow down, and to serve. All ways we act out our worship, all ways that we worship God. Action words, remember. So. Reach up for Sebamai, bow down for Proskuneo, and then reach out for Latrevo. Okay? Uh, again, up and down and out and up and down and out and up and down and out and up and up and down and out. My form was excellent on that. I'm gonna just rest for a second. It's not so much this as much as the whole thing. Can someone give me a medic or something? I can, I'm good, actually I'm good. Ah, too, many, uh, too many pancakes is all. <clears throat> and uh, despite all the worship calisthenics, our original meaning is still there. To declare how much something is worth. And at the top of our worth chart, no, not money or chocolate chip pancakes or even the church potluck. Of course, it's God. And that's why worshiping God is the most important action. I'm not do an action. <laughs> it's the most important action that we take. I'm gonna sit down for this last bit if that's okay. All right, if you would like to learn more, ask your pastor. Tell them Chuck sent you. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's good. Nope. I, I think one was one was enough. Now I written need two towels. Thank you. Did I look like Rocky in that first part? Chuck knows church. He, I mean, he talks about a lot. I don't know if you're not familiar. Look him up. He's got lots of topics, and he's he's really good. So worship is uh, is an action that we take, right? I think that's an important thing that he's trying to get across in this, and we're going to, I hope that you can follow Claire's lead, because uh, Claire has it down, the worship calisthenics, and she's probably going to be able to lead us at the end of the service when we get back to uh, our own worship calisthenics. Uh, but worship, which is worthiness, acknowledgement of worth, and it comes from worth end, which is to declare how much uh, something is worth. And he says, Sebomai, right? Say that with me. Sebomai, which is to lift up high or exalt, which is what we do with God. We lift him up everywhere that we go, whether it's at work or at school, or it's not just a Sunday morning thing. And to bow down, proskuneo. One, two, three. Perfect. That was great. So, and that which is to, I think it's to bow down, right? It's to, it's to bow down before him, which is, which is an adoration piece. And Latrevo. Latrevo, which is to serve, which is to reach out to others. This is what we do in worship. We reach out to others. I like how this mimics a couple of commandments that were given. Love the Lord your God. And revere him, but love your neighbor as yourself, which is to reach out. We are not to be an internally focused body. We are to be an externally focused. So worship, worship is an action. It's a verb. It's not passive. It's not just about come, come to church, but it's not just coming to church once a week. That's not what worship is. It's, it, it's about doing. It's about lifting up high. Sebomai, to lift up high. Uh, proskuneo, to bow down. Uh, Latrevo, to reach out to others, right? Do that with me. Sebomai. What's that one? Proskuneo. 
Latrevo, to reach out. That's what worship is. It's not sitting on our keisters and doing nothing. It's, it's about doing it. We're to live lives of worship, lives that show God clearly to others. That God, when people look at us, we may be the only Jesus they ever see. They, we may be the only Bible they ever read. So what do they see at work? What do they see at home? What do they see in the store? What do they see in the parking lot? What do they see on I-85? I know, now, what's that, gone to metal in it? Yeah. <laughs> so how do we do this? How do we live this way? And, and this is where Romans 12, 1, 2 comes in, right? It's a three, three points from Romans 12, 1 and 2. It, the first is that we become a living sacrifice. That's point number one. And the second is don't give in to the world. And the third is change our thinking. That's the three, point, uh, three points in this. But the first is become a living sacrifice. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You know what's cool about this? Where is the temple? You, yes. Where's the Holy Spirit hanging out? Yeah, he lives within us. Isn't that cool? He's still in the temple, but the temple moved. <laughs> the temple is us. The Holy Spirit is within us. We carry God with us. In the Old Testament, sacrifices, we talked about this a couple of, of, of weeks ago, about the blood and the need for sacrifices. But we're supposed to be living sacrifices. That means that how we live matters. How we act matters. The things we do matter in this world. We're supposed to be giving our bodies as living Sacrifices. I have a friend. In fact, he's the one who actually taught me those Hebrew blessings. I, he taught me those before I went to seminary, you know. And uh, he, he's a Messianic Jew. He was raised Jewish and then converted to uh, Christianity. He never gave much thought about converting to Christianity, but things happened in his life, and he was led to Christ. And he had a very special understanding of giving. His name's Pete Sternberg. Hey, Pete. And this is a while. He did this a long time ago. This is from March of 2003. Fad Zaki and Samia Muharib were driving across Gwinnett. This is from a newspaper article. Were driving across Gwinnett County searching for a church where they could ask for prayers for their 13-year-old granddaughter who needed a kidney to save her life. They found open doors at McKendry UMC in Lawrenceville. Anybody know McKendry? Yeah. Inside, they found people to pray for Heba Nassim. They also found one church member, my friend, who volunteered to donate his own kidney to a little girl he had never met. And that was last October. Now, this was 11 years later. So he was, uh, or gosh, he was 30 now. So however many years that is from now. My friend, has, who had an 11-year-old daughter to Hillary at that time, had never met Heva until a, a few weeks before the surgery. But he knew that God was calling him to help this child. He gave his kidney to somebody he didn't know. God prompted him to give a kidney to somebody because he heard about it and God got on him. He said this, Pete said this, the only risk I was taking was if my sweetheart Hillary, his daughter, who, who was 11, would need a kidney someday and I wouldn't be able to do it. And that was a risk I was willing to take. I knew I was led to do this. I knew I was led to do this. And my friend had been a Christian only two years now. He's been a Christian a while now. But back then it was only two years. Don't let anybody, I don't know how long you've been in in the faith, don't let anybody tell you just because you haven't been a Christian very long that you can't be impactful and that God can't use you. Some of the most passionate Christians are are off the, uh, you know, accept Christ and go tell people, right? Because that's what, you know, they get a passion to them and they want people to know about this Jesus, so they go tell people. You know what? Don't let people put you down, you know? Don't let them. Don't let them, don't let them keep you from sharing. But he became a living sacrifice, and, and Pete's still a humble guy. He, he went, I, I met him at Emmaus. He, he's part of a group called the Walkman. They've been meeting at uh, Chick-fil-A in Duluth for 20 years probably now, you know, as, as, a, as a reunion group. And he knew that God was asking him for a sacrifice, and he said yes because he was willing to be that living sacrifice. God prompted him to do it, and he did it. That's being a living sacrifice. So some questions that we can ask ourselves are, what are we living for? What is it that I'm living for? What are you living for? What is your ultimate goal in life? 
Is it for me? Is it for myself? Or am I living to please God? Where is God in the mix? You know, because the world's going to try and take us away from a focus on God to a focus on ourselves or on stuff and that. Where is God in the mix of the calling that we have? Some passages of scripture, Philippians 1.21, for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's a passage of hope for those of us who, who are in the faith. 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of yourself. Oh, wait, I got that wrong. That's do it all for the glory of God. Matthew 6.33, seek last the kingdom of God and maybe stuff will happen for you. Wrong again? Seek ye. Ye. (laughs) The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Ephesians 5.8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So do what? Live as children of light. Walk as children of light. And the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And these scriptures and many more tell us how to give our bodies to God as living sacrifices. Because basically it means that we are to live for him over ourselves. We're to put him first, not second. This is how we are made. Because we are made to worship, to take the actions, right? Sebomai, which means? Proskuneo. Latrevo. That's right. So, so we are made to lift up, bow down, and reach out. That's what we're made. That's the worship that we're talking about. That's worship. When, we face, when we're faced with decisions in this life, we have to choose what we're going to do, his way or, I way, or our way. So I hope that we choose his way, right? But it's our life, and it's our choice, and we get to turn him down or not. But I hope that we choose his way, because that's going to bring him glory instead of ourselves. And it means that we're going to, cho- we're going to choose to purposely obey him over ourselves, that we're going to trust him to send the blessings that we need into our life. And we're going to trust that we're blessed even when we don't think we're blessed. For God works some things out to the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose? Did I mess again? I messed up again. It's all? all. Uh, what does that mean? All. all. Oh, all means it's still? Still all means all? That's just crazy talk. God works all things out to the good. That means good or bad by our judgment, God will take it, turn it into something that is useful for his glory as we seek to turn it over to him. But we, ha- we can't give in to the world. We can't give in. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world. So here's the deal. Uh, some of y'all are familiar with this, right? Thermometers or thermostats. What's the difference? One tells you what it is and the other determines what it's going to come, right? Is that right, Polly? You deal with this a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah so, so thermostats, you know, they tell us what the temperature is, but, but, or, or thermometers tell us what the temperature is. Thermostats regulate the temperature, right? They, they, and and what, are we, what do you think we're supposed to be as Christians? Thermostats, absolutely. Because if we're thermometers, we're going to go wherever the temperature is, right? We're going to go towards the temperature that we desire. And we're going to hang out there. But if we are the regulators of that temperature, then we're following and, and we're seeking God and the way of Christ, then we're regulating the temperature according to his will. The thinking of the world tends to be focused on itself, sinful, carnal, uh, sin, pleasure. That's where it's at. James Engel, Engel is an uh, atheist, and he summarized the belief system and presuppositions of modern man that are commonly held. God, if he exists at all, is just an impersonal moral force. Man basically has the capacity, humanity, within himself or herself to improve morally and make the right choices. Happiness consists of unlimited material acquisition. There really is no objective basis for right and wrong. The supernatural is just a figment of someone's imagination. 
If a person lives a good life, the eternal destiny is assured, and the Bible is nothing more than a book written by man. That's humanist thinking, that secular world thinking. George Gallup had this to say. He was addressing a group of Southern Baptist leaders. We find that there is very little difference in ethical behavior between churchgoers and those who are not active religiously. The levels of lying, cheating, and stealing are remarkably similar in both groups. Eight out of ten Americans consider themselves Christians, yet only about half of them could identify the person who gave the Sermon on the Mount. Who gave the Sermon on the Mount? Oh, whew. Thank you. <laughs> Fewer still could recall five of the Ten Commandments. Only two in ten said they would be willing to suffer for their faith. You see, what we say is not as important as how we live. And worship is an action. It's a verb. It's how we live. It's important. So what is it? Uh, now you don't have the cheat sheet. Sebomai. Proskuneo. Letrevo. Look at you guys. Yeah. It's good. That's good stuff. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> and Claire's got the moves. You should have seen her when, when it was going on. She's like, woo, woo, woo. I need you later because... We're going to teach the whole congregation how to do it. No, it's good. Claire and Rhett are going to teach the congregation how to do that. You're, you're going to be able to do that, Rhett? Rhett's like, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> John 15, 19. If you belong to the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world because of this, the world hates you. Does the world hate us? Or is the world happy with this? You know, that's a barometer that is like, ooh, I don't know that I want to look at that because you know, nobody I know of is really ticked off at me. <laughs> you know? Galatians 3.22. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin, so we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Who is the way, the truth, and the life? And no one goes to the Father except Jesus. 1 John 2. Do not love the world. Or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, eyes, pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. And the lust of it. Read that last part for me. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Forever. How long is that? Forever, and it's forever right? <laughs> Y'all are getting too used to me now. You're answering the obvious with the obvious. Yeah, that's right. All means all and forever means forever. It's not, not complex. <laughs> so we must not give in to the world or, or worldly ways. The world is a killer of our faith. The world will drag us away from our faith. You know, uh, you heard that part about the supernatural. And, and you know, I, I, I love the scientific method. You've heard me preach on this. I love the scientific method. I think it's really a powerful thing. But you can't test faith by the scientific method because if it fits in the scientific method and it's replicable, it's not supernatural and it's not, you know. God doesn't fit in the scientific model of, of, or scientific method. We must be thermostats. Thermostats. We must be the ones who are acting instead of responding. And that requires us to change our thinking. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is. You want to know what God's will is in your life? Yeah, I think most, most of us do. Okay, well, don't conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What's the key? Renewing of your mind. That way we can have a shot at figuring out what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So don't be a conformist, be a transformist. Right? We, we want to be a transformer. Transformers more than meets the eye. Is that right, Rhett? No, it's wrong. <laughs> no, 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 Batman. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, my. 
I love it. I, I, I love this. This is this. <laughs> it helps my heart. <laughs> Where was I? Transformist. Transformist. Not a, con- not a conformist. Uh, but this isn't going to happen unless we renew our mind. So that we push so hard for that around here just because of that. We realize that the world will get you busy, and we know that it's not always the first thing in our head is to seek to study and, and, and to spend time in the Word and spend time with other people it, because the world just takes our time, takes time away from us, you know, and there's stuff that can be more fun, to be blunt, you know. I play March of Empires. Anybody, you know, you know that can take me away from time with God if I'm not intentional. But it's why we seek it out, because we want to be transformers. We want to seek out wise counsel. We want to see transformation in our lives. We want to see transformation in other lives. Paul Butler is president of Ozark Christian College. He said this a long time ago in a sermon. The doing will never be right until the thinking is right. Our thinking has brought us to where we are today, and our thinking will take us to where we will be tomorrow. So we have to challenge our thinking. Our thinking leads us sometimes down a path that is not the right path. And so we need to renew our minds so that we can be transformed in the way that we think so that we can do the things and follow the path that God lays before us. So we saturate our mind with the word of God. We bring in scripture. And I, I told you on this trip, it was crazy. I, it just, you know, if you're riding around and you're on your own, just put on, you know, the Bible. Let it just run. You don't have to, sp- let it just kind of seep its way in, you know, as you're driving around. You know, that's a, a critical part. Bibles are, are huge for us. The scripture is given to us so that we might learn more about the character and the will of God and to give us some hope because almost every character in the Bible was a screwball. You know, they all messed up pretty much. And what did God do? He used them to do incredible, incredible things. And they all were flawed. Every single one. They had flaws. Anybody in here have flaws? Yeah, you know, we got flaws. What does that mean? It means God can use you too. You know, that's Bible's message, Scripture's message, one of those messages to us. Plus, if you're going to ask someone else how they're doing in study, it's probably a good idea that you're doing something yourself. So that when they say, well, what are you doing? (laughs) And this is the path to transformation. Young, old, rich, poor, male, female, none of that stuff matters when we're in the body of Christ. This study is critical for us, and God wants us to live transformed lives. Matthew 16, 23, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. This is that Peter. Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Now, why would he do that, right? See, when we don't keep our in, in mind or in our minds the things of God, we can get out of whack and even betray Jesus. This is Peter who passionately was supporting Jesus, but because he didn't have in his mind the things of God, he moved away from the path that God had. You know, Peter was saying, never, you're not going to die. That's not going to happen. I won't let it happen. But part of the plan was for Jesus to die. So Jesus rebuked him and said, that's, that's not where we're going with this. We're go- I have to go to the cross. There's going to be some people at Arbor Point Church 2,000 plus years from, from or almost 2,000 years from now that, that need me to go to the cross. Don't stop me from doing that. I'm going to follow the will of God. So Jesus lowered the boom on, on Peter and said, look, here's what God wants. I'm going to do what he wants. You're not thinking that way, so start thinking that way. And it's easy to, you know, it's easy to do this, right? The Pharisees, who did Jesus get on the most was me, people like me. The guys who stood, you know, the pastors of the time, the Pharisees, the, the teachers of the law. You know, he, he got on us worse than you vipers, you snakes, you serious. I mean, he, he was not kind because we, we had it wrong and we were teaching it wrong. And they missed him. John the Baptist comes. And, and he's out at the river, and he's dressed wrong. He, don't you know? He's wearing like this, this smelly clothing. St- what was that? It was not sackcloth. It was uh, cam- yeah, camel's hairs. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't nice. It was, you know, uh, he got kicked out of a lot of churches today if you went in that way, right? So, but that's not the important part. The important part is our heart. Where is our worship, where is 
our focus. See, Scripture says we're going to be known by our fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit, oh no, we won't do that. <laughs> but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. It's up here. Kindness. <laughs> I just halfway through that, I'm like, dude, it's right there. (laughs) Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And it's when we live our lives in pursuit of that fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that's when we find contentment because we are made to worship. You are made to worship everywhere that you go. God is with you. You became the temple of the Holy Spirit because you are literally made to worship. That's who you are. You are the place of worship. Isn't that cool? It's amazing. It's amazing. Jesus died and rose for you. It's amazing. It's good stuff. And you have the ability to live this transformed life through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. And we are called Imago Dei. We are made in the image of God himself, the creator of all things. It's why we come together in worship. That's why we have a message and and fellowship time and, and prayer and communion and all of these elements that are worship. And if you wandered from him, come on home. You're welcome. You're welcome home. He is not the one who's going to keep you away. Too many times, you know, we get in our head and, and, and we convince ourselves we're not good enough to come. You are good enough to come. He died for you. He loves you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. If you don't know him, he invites you to come to know him. He wants to fill that empty space inside with love and light and peace and truth. This is who our God is. It's an incredible thing. It's incredible. Okay. So I did want to leave. Claire, would you mind coming up and helping me? Will you come up and help me? Rhett, do you want to come up and help too? Okay, come on. Y'all have to stand up, so you might as well stand up. As you're able. Okay, we're going to do, remember, we're going to do several my Proskuneo, the Trevo, right? Okay, so here we go, everybody, right? Sebo my to lift high. Proskuneo to bow down. Le Trevo to reach out. Sebo my. Proskuneo, le Trevo. Sebo my. Proskuneo, le Trevo. Sebo my. Proskuneo, le Trevo. I think I pulled my glute. <laughs> Beautiful. That was awesome. Woo! Right on. That's worship calisthenics. That's, that's your goal for this week is when you wake up in the morning, just remember, Sevamai, Proskuneo, Latrevo. And you will have the actions of your day planned out for you. It's an incredible thing. Michael, you ready?